для советского народа это была Великая Отечественная война. Он вел ее во имя свободы и независимости своей социалистической родины, во имя избавления Европы, да и всего мира от фашистского порабощения. 20 миллионов жизней советских людей унесла эта война. Наш народ не забудет ее никогда. Леонид Ильич Брежнев I'm Bert Lancaster. In this episode of The Unknown War, there are no battle scenes, no sounds of gunfire. This is the story of ordinary Russian civilians who worked to supply the military with tanks, planes, guns, whatever was necessary to win the war against the Nazis. Little is known about the planned evacuation of more than 1,500 Russian factories out of the path of Hitler's armies, onto flat cars, freight cars, trucks, went the components of factory after factory. Far to the east, beyond the Urals, here in Siberia, and here in Central Asia, the factories were reassembled. There, vital war material was produced for the fighting at the front. Our story, to the east. the Germans were fond of saying is learned by guns. They would eventually discover the truth of that. since Bismarck to think in terms of blood and iron, they prepared in the spring of 1941 for Hitler's drive to the east. The Soviet Union, he had told them, was ripe for the plucking. Germany had coal and steel aplenty. Her technology was advanced, her industry highly productive, her labor force swollen by the peoples she had subjugated. under Hitler was united with a single aim. Hitler finalized his plans for Operation Barbarossa, its aim the extinction of the Soviet Union. the zenith of a power, and every German felt a part of it. They had come into their inheritance. Germany's appetite was prodigious. Food arrived by the train load from the conquered lands. Fish from Norway, eggs from Belgium, cheese, meat, wine from Denmark, Holland, France. These were the fruits of victory. shared in the affluence brought by the war. In 
less than a decade, trading on the disgrace of the First World War, Hitler had made Germans masters of all of Western Europe. Germany, they sang, Germany over everything. Now the pattern was repeated in the East on an enormous scale. On June 22, 1941, the Blitzkrieg swept over the border to devastate Russia, obliterating cities, towns, people. Hundreds of thousands of civilians in the path of the assault, the world they had known was wiped away, and they watched everything around them dissolve in flames. The fires blazed from the Baltic to the Black Sea, farms, towns, factories, cities. Survival lay in flight. All across the Ukraine, Belarusia, the Baltic states, the streams of refugees gathered, traveling by whatever means they could, Stunned in fear of their lives, they knew only one direction, east, into the heartlands of Russia. They took with them whatever was most precious. Hundreds, thousands, tens, then hundreds of thousands, the streams became a flood. Stoically, patiently, they waited for their only hope of salvation along the railroads already being bombed and strafed by Nazi planes. They waited for days without complaint. Some not understanding, all just trying to survive. What they had been forced to leave behind was a major part of Russia's wealth. When the Germans overran the Ukraine, they took Russia's richest source of grain, sugar beet, pork, beef, milk, butter, cheese. They took the great iron and coal centers of the Donbas, their power plants in Nipa. They swallowed everything of value. What the Germans did not need, they destroyed. What little the victims had rescued from the devastation, they often had to jettison. In Moscow, the Soviet government had established an evacuation council by the third day of the war. It had to deal with a forced exodus of millions and reorganize an entire economy. One of the organizers was Alexei Kosygin, later Prime Minister of the Soviet Union. We had to withdraw for a period of time from the most developed areas of the country, for Russia traditionally grew from the west to the east as, say, the United States started from the East Coast. We no longer had our iron and steel in the South. 
we no longer had our main arable lands. The fascists overran our main coal source of the time, the Donbass. To go on fighting, to live until V-Day, it was necessary for us, in an unprecedentedly short time, to reorganize the national economy to suit the needs of war, to shift a considerable part of our industry to the east, and there, starting over quite often at zero level, to construct major war plants and other factories. The main instrument of victory, over 95% of all types of armament and ammunition, was produced by our Soviet home front. Of course, we also paid tribute to those who helped us with weapons and equipment in the war years, to our allies. We render homage to the greatness of the immortal exploit of the workers of the home front. Of course, you remember only too well how in the summer of 1941, from the western regions of the Soviet Union, an endless stream of people, equipment, food, thousands of factories, millions and millions of people moved to the east. To dismantle assembly lines, strip down the machines, load them into ships and trains, factory after factory, with the sound of the guns drawing nearer and nearer. Leonid Brezhnev was in charge of moving plants from part of the Ukraine. One important war plant in Leningrad was dismantled after the city had been surrounded and was rushed out of the city through a gauntlet of Nazi shell fire. The workers left Leningrad with the machines and were resettled in Siberia. They were back in almost full production in days. not be moved it was destroyed, including the mammoth power plant and the Dnieper, the pride of Stalin's five-year plan. Hundreds of major factories in hundreds of locations in Western Russia were packed up. And with them went the workers. That was the design. It was a design to save the Soviet Union's capacity to build the weapons that would preserve the nation. It was a design that had never been attempted before, and there was pain in it. In the vast migration, there was little rest, great loss, much uncertainty. possible, art treasures were carried to safety. One third of the invaluable Hermitage collection in Leningrad was shipped to the Urals. Tatiana Sokolova worked at the Hermitage in those days. You remember the statue of Voltaire. He's sitting in a chair with his hands resting on the arms. Imagine, if you will, when the statue was carried down the staircase, it started to sway. Voltaire seemed alive. It's unbelievable how alive he became. And with those sparkling eyes, he had a look that was so ironic, so mocking, that the stone seemed to come to life. He distinctly said, don't worry. I'll be back. On the collective farms, the farm tools were driven across the fields for the last time to be transported to the virgin lands of the Soviet East. time the livestock was patiently herded to far-off pastures. In haste, 
fast with the enemy approaching, they salvaged what they could. The rest they burned or buried to deny to the Germans. Statistics alone could not show what was lost and what was saved. The Soviet railroads were among the most extensive in Europe and crammed with rolling stock and locomotives. They were accustomed to moving masses of material. Harnessed to the war effort, the railroads were vital in the supply of troops to the front and the evacuation of civilians away from it. They were a prime target for the Germans. The Luftwaffe ranged along the tracks, bombing and strafing to create as much confusion as they could. Those tactics had worked well in the fall of France. Day after day, week after week, the Nazi bombers raked the odds. It was as perilous a battleground as the front line, and there could be no fighting back. crews, truckers. Anyone whose duty lay in the freight yards was in mortal danger. Working in the open, they were absolutely defenseless. What the bombers accomplished in minutes, it took hours, days to clear. Fortunately, the Germans were as systematic as ever. They stuck to a rigid schedule. So trains could be diverted away from the target area and held until the attack was over. to their destinations. The Soviets had begun the war with an abundance of rolling stock. Now they had to husband it. Whatever the obstacles, the rail traffic had to get through. The railroads were Russia's arteries. While the wreckage still smoldered, the tracks east and west were cleared until the next attack. There was no time to test the damaged structures or the jerry-rigged substitutes. It was press through or die. train crews, every mile was a hazard as they traveled within range of the Nazi bombers. Closer to the front lines, the railroad men were even within reach of the German guns and any stray Nazi planes wandering the battlefield. Yelena Chuknyuk was one of the engineers. I 
думаю, ну что такое, вот шатает вот так вот паровоз и вагон и все. The German front line had already reached Yefremovka station near Moscow by the time I got there. Then the engines started to shake. Large caliber shells were flying right over our heads. Shells that size created a vacuum, and the engine and coaches would shake back and forth. As I pulled into the station, I picked up speed. Then I saw the aircraft overhead. I thought, they're going to bomb us now, and I slammed on the brakes. The bombers had counted on my moving fast and they missed me. All the bombs exploded ahead of me and the train was safe. Sometimes, though, it didn't work that way. Just as I hit the brakes, they dropped the bombs. I think of that as my contribution to the war effort and to victory. At Stalingrad, I was burned all over when my train was hit. All the dresses I had with me burned, too. I had nothing to wear but my uniform. In the first six months of the war, 1,500 military plants were snatched away from the Germans. Train after train steamed into these alien lands that were still Russia, the Urals, Central Asia, Siberia. It was like moving the industry of Illinois to Alaska. Vast, rich, peaceful, the new lands stretched forever. Half a million passenger coaches, 2,700 a day for weeks on end, rattled through from the West, from disaster to security. of the Luftwaffe, their enemies now were time and shortage of materials. In the first year of the war, nearly 10 million people were resettled in the East, the biggest migration in the history of mankind. After the first welcomes, there would be occasional conflicts, inevitable in a movement of such magnitude. But together they worked to get the plants back in production, in factory buildings that did not yet exist. Siberia was iron hard. They had to blow it open to lay the foundations of the new factories. Concrete and steel were in short supply, but they worked through the night by the light of bonfires and torches. In the Siberian winter, the workers' hands froze at the metal of their shovels. They built a total of 2,000 new plants in the Urals and Siberia. More than one a day before the war was over. Some kinds of production had never been seen there before. The East was no longer a new frontier. It was the Soviet Union's industrial heart. Factories came before homes for the immigrants. from the West, the people from Moscow, Kiev, the Don Basin, Leningrad, shared what was available until their new cities could be built. Composer Sergei Prokofiev and director Sergei Eisenstein were among the immigrants. They were making a classic movie, Ivan the Terrible, the story of a 16th century Tsar whose wars had made Russia a power to be reckoned with. It appealed to the people's patriotic feelings and their bitter struggle against the Nazis. They filmed it in the deserts of Kazakhstan.
In a growing flood, the weapons of war rolled westward from Siberia. This monument is not to a person, but to a plane, the IL-2. The IL-2 was one of the planes assembled mainly in the east. At the outset of the war, there were fewer than 100 such aircraft in the Soviet Union. By war's end, 41,000 had been built. The inscription at the base of the monument reads, we needed these planes as badly as we needed air, as we needed bread. The plane is a tribute to the determination of the Russians to gain superiority over the Nazis. Design bureaus and research institutes had come east with the war plans. They produced and tested the machines that would prove superior to what the Germans could send against them. The Soviets had some brilliant aircraft designers. Yorkovlev, Tupolev, Navochkin. Sergei Ilyushin, designer of the famous IL-2, better known as the Sturmovik, was a ground support aircraft. The engine and the cockpit were heavily armored. The fuselage was built of wood. It was difficult to destroy and easy to repair. The Germans christened it the Flying Tank. In action, the Sturmovik was formidable, especially against Hitler's panzers. The directors of this gigantic new industry had myriad problems. They'd lost much of their high-grade steel capacity when the Ukraine was overrun, and 60% of their coal in the Donbas. Dmitry Ustinov was a defense commissar at the time of the great move to the east. As such, he was one of the leaders who organized the industrial effort. Later, he was to become defense minister of the Soviet Union. Я в те годы, молодой инженер, был назначен в партии на пост Народного комиссара вооружений. И сейчас я с большой теплотой и гордостью... In those years, I, a young engineer, was appointed by the party to be People's Commissar for Armaments. And today I recall with great warmth and pride the concerted and selfless effort made by all the collectives of workers, engineers, designers, by all those who worked so heroically to forge the arms of victory, and with whom I worked shoulder to shoulder. Yes, indeed, the conditions really were most difficult. And yet, despite the occupation of large areas of the country, we succeeded not only in increasing the output of arms and materiel, but also in achieving both quantitative and qualitative superiority over the enemy's armaments. During the war, all Soviet people, whether at the battlefront or on the home front, were inspired by one thought alone, to defeat the enemy. Success on the home front engendered victory at the battlefront, and the line of battle ran through the hearts of soldiers in the trenches and workers in the rear. In an incredibly short time, the new weapons began to come off the assembly lines. Production was concentrated on a small number of designs, but each was turned out by the thousand. By the end of the second year of the war, Soviet production had outstripped Germany's. Morozov, 
Koshkin, Kucherenko, designers of a revolutionary new tank. It was the T-34 and it was a masterpiece, the best tank produced in the war by either side. It was very fast, heavily armored, powerfully gunned. In 1940, only 115 T-34s existed. Two years later, 15,500 had been delivered to the Red Army. The Soviets had had to achieve a second instant industrial revolution, first finding new sources of iron and other ores in the East and untapped coal fields to feed the furnaces. As battle succeeded battle, workers who had been sent to the East were now needed for the Red Army. Russia's reserves of manpower, vast as they were, were being stretched to the limit. The battle line needed men, but so did the assembly line. The gap was filled by those who had already earned a few years of rest. The old taught the young and remembered their own skills. Now their textbooks were the lathes, the drills, the presses that turned out the armaments for their fathers at the front. This boy's father was killed in action. One boy recalled, I wasn't very tall, so they had to give me something to stand on so I could run the machine. I would get everything ready before I started on my shift, so I wouldn't have to waste a minute. His shift lasted 12 hours. But what mattered was not size, it was enthusiasm. And love. One boy sent a note with his product. This is the 10,000th machine gun I've assembled. I'm proud of it. The work required skill and sometimes more strength than the children thought they had. Somehow they found it. The majority of the workers were women. They too learned unfamiliar skills. And unwelcome sorrows. A woman might put in as many as 14 hours of back-breaking work at the plant, then go home to cook and care for her children and elderly relatives. And this, knowing only that her husband was at the front, far to the west. The work demanded the utmost of body and mind. No Russian woman had ever operated a blast furnace before. It called for strength, great skill, expert judgment. Faina Shoronova was foreman of a blast furnace. I really grew to love that work. At first, I didn't think about likes or dislikes, but I think subconsciously I wanted to do it. Then I made my first fusion. It was a special kind of pig iron, and you know, it made me take that number two blast furnace to my heart forever. Even today, I just love it. I talked to her like a friend. I'd say, there, there, my dear furnace. You've got to know, my dear, how much we need that metal. Shirts, greatcoats, mittens, boots, gear of all kinds for the fighting men, 
came out of the eastern plants by the tens of millions. Some of the workers cared for their families and tended their machines at the same time. Everywhere, in every profession, every trade, skilled and unskilled, the women took over. There was a popular song they all knew. It spoke of waiting, of loneliness, of hope, and of love. It was called the Blue Kerchief. of Russia had passed into Nazi hands. Brought to the east, the tractors broke new ground in the Urals in Central Asia. Much of the labor, hard as it was, fell to the women. On occasion, transportation of their produce took exotic forms. As if their sacrifice were not enough already, the women surrendered their valuables to the war effort. Throughout the East, the heirlooms were handed to the state. Russian, Kazakh, Uzbek, Ukrainian, Kyrgyz women gave their adornments and their treasures to finance the war. Precious stones amounted to many tons. They bought tanks, guns, warplanes. Some gave money, their savings, and they stood in line to hand it over. The total came to 16 billion rubles. People donated could not replace the great oil refineries of the Caucasus, the mines of the Ukraine, the shipyards of the Baltic and the Black Sea, and the huge power plants of the Dnieper. But it could help to build anew. Even those who had already served at the front made contributions. Material things mattered less than victory, at any cost. 
actors, artists, poets, scientists, all contributed. The company of the Mali Theater, the most prestigious in Russia, gave enough for a whole squadron of fighters. The Russian Orthodox Church funded a tank column. When it was ready for action, the Patriarch Sergei came to bless it and send it on its way. Some individuals became legends for their efforts. Maria Oktabrska, age 27, from the Volga region. Maria's husband, a regular officer in the army. He was killed in the second year of the war. Maria sold their home and everything in it to pay for a tank. She became the Red Army's first woman tank driver. Maria and her crew saw plenty of action. She was killed during the liberation of Smolensk in September 1943. They buried Maria Oktyabrska with full military honors. Many Russian women fought in the front line in the Great Patriotic War. Many more served in the factories, munitions plants, and hospitals. Perhaps these were more traditional roles, but they performed them superbly. Those they comforted did not forget those who attended them through the darkness. Some women held down two jobs, one in the plant and then a shift at the hospital. In addition to everything else, they gave blood. Worst of all, as always in disaster, was the plight of the children. Many were orphaned. Many separated from their parents in the chaos of evacuation. Many were wounded, starving, ill with one disease or another. Many had been burned. All had become familiar with fear and pain and loneliness. In the East, some of them were given a new life. People of all kinds, of all nationalities, took them into their homes. And very soon, the fear and the loneliness fell away. Yet 
It had been an upheaval unprecedented in any society. The transfer of the greater part of an economy and a huge proportion of the population to undeveloped territories a thousand miles away and there to establish the equal of any industrial power in Europe. And finally, to outproduce the formidable plants of Germany. As the war ground westward, each battle produced new refugees. Many came to the east to start their lives again. But it was the tide of the gigantic evacuation of the first six months that made eventual victory possible. 10,000 tanks, 100,000 planes, cannon by the thousands, rifle and submachine guns by the millions, ammunition by the tens of millions of tons. This was their achievement. Tears and sweat, they had rebuilt the Soviet war machine, more powerful than ever. They had turned loss into overwhelming strength. Now the trains traveled without hindrance, at full speed. Their destinations, Warsaw, Belgrade, Berlin, and Russia's victory in the unknown war. Наш следующий фильм «Оборона Сталинграда». В конце 1942 года мощные гитлеровские армии двинулись на юг к советским нефтяным месторождениям в Закавказье. Упорно сражавшаяся советская армия была оттеснена к Волге. Там, у стен Сталинграда, советские воины стояли насмерть. Это было решающее сражение Великой Отечественной войны.